Hello everybody. Today I'm driving a Bentley, but you could in fact call this the Bentley. This is an example of a Bentley 3 litre, the first car ever made by the company. This particular model was built in 1922, the first year they were available for the public to buy. Now back then, things were done a little bit differently. You see, coach building was still very much a thing. So high-end motor manufacturers supplied a rolling chassis. In other words, you bought from Bentley, not a whole car, but instead the engine, gearbox, the wheels, the basic frame, and some of the interior parts. And then your coach builder put a body on top to your own personal specifications, which is very much how high-end families have been doing it for hundreds of years previously with their old-fashioned horses. This meant you could, of course, have a car however you wanted it. But it also meant in order for a company to stand out, their mechanicals had to be something special. And Bentleys were. This car was a little bit bigger than the Bugatti equivalent of the time, although also somewhat smaller than some cars which had come before. The engine, as in many Bentleys since, is what makes this rather special. And in fact, there is, like the modern Bentley, a bit of a German connection. You see, in 1914, Mercedes, to celebrate their victory, one of the earliest Grand Prix races, had parked their Grand Prix car in a London showroom. Then, slightly later in 1914, Germans suddenly became very unpopular and so a young W.O. Bentley, then working in the military, suggested to the army they might want to repossess that Grand Prix car, tear apart the engine and find out what made it tick. They used what they learned with that to then build this. It's a three-litre, four-cylinder, and even by modern standards, actually has some quite impressive specifications. There are penta heads in the combustion chamber, which I mean they're sort of hemispherical, but not quite a hemi head. You have four valves per cylinder. That apparently was done to aid cooling rather than performance. You have an aluminium camshaft, aluminium pistons. You even have twin spark ignition with two entirely independent systems, meaning that it should be relatively durable. When new, this engine was good for 70 horsepower and a top speed of allegedly 80 mile an hour. Above this, you had a speed model and above that, a super sports, branding which Bentley still used to this very day. The super sports was good, apparently, for 100 mile an hour. More incredible than all of that, though, is the fact Bentley supplied the regular and speeds with a five-year warranty. But the Super Sports, because of its extremely high compression ratio, 6.3 to 1, and its racy nature, came with only the one year's warranty. So from the very beginnings, Bentley always had one eye on quality, not just performance. Very early on, racing became a big part of the Bentley scene. They entered the first ever Le Mans in 1922 and won the second ever Le Mans in 1923. They also won in class in 1924 and subsequently entered any race they could find where they thought they had a good chance of winning while a lot of people were watching. This particular car also has a very special history of its own. When you get to cars of this nature, people often start talking in terms of chassis numbers to identify individual cars. This is chassis number 77. The oldest Bentley in the entire world is chassis number 3 and has engine number 4. This has engine number 5. It originally started with engine number 83, and we don't really know what happened, but we have had it verified that this is indeed a very, very old engine. It's no longer entirely original, and as mentioned, this car when produced didn't have a body at all. It was fitted with a saloon body made by Park Ward, a well-respected coach builder of the time. This was later modified into what you see now, which is an open tourer, and we believe this was a very literal modification. They simply cut the roof, off the old saloon to make what you see now. There's comfy seating for two or cramped seating for four, but if you do that, you've got no luggage space. There are still seats back here under this very nice cover and the car's in this beautiful green, which I think is always the right color for a Bentley. 77 was acquired by a man called Kenneth in 1990. He used it for a few years and then stopped when age meant that he couldn't enjoy it as much as he'd like to. His son, Julian, acquired it in 2012, and that's the lovely chap who's brought it to me today. By the time he got it, the car was really a non-runner, so he decided to begin the process of bringing it back to life so that he could enjoy it. The first thing was to make it roadworthy, and then began the really difficult process, undoing many decades of bodge jobs from where these cars 
weren't really the pristine, desirable classics that they are now. They were at one point simply an old car, so they weren't really looked after in the way they should have been. It turns out that Bentleys really are a family affair too, because much of the work on this has been undertaken by a firm called VBE of Warwickshire, originally run by a man called Richard Cresswell and now run by his son Tim. I am also delighted to say that this car has been restored not simply to look at but actually to drive, to use and enjoy as Walter Owen I think would have wanted. In fact it's going next year to both the Le Mans Classic and the Isle of Man TT where it will be celebrating the centenary of Bentley winning the team prize there in 1922. As you may imagine though, driving a car of this vintage isn't always the simplest affair. Now compared with the Model T that I drove, which is a few years earlier than this, there are quite a few differences and in some ways this is a lot more modern. Now in no particular order, let me talk you through the controls. So outside the car you have here a handbrake which you operate in a fairly easy fashion. You pull this little lever here and it will turn itself off Then to put it back on, pull it much like a modern item. On the steering wheel, you'll notice two controls, we'll get to those in a moment. Down here, unlike the Model T, you've also got a regular four-speed H-pattern gear shift and reverse is activated by lifting the lockout here and pulling it over and down. On the floor, at the top left, you'll find the starter. You'd also find the starter on the floor in a Model T if you'd specified it, and I noticed this car does still have a hand crank at the front if you're really in trouble. The bottom left item is a dip switch, which used to turn the headlights down a little bit. Then you have three pedals. Well, two pedals and what looks like a doorknob. The one on the left is the clutch, as you'd expect. It works just like you'd think. The one in the middle is the accelerator, and the one on the right is the brake. Now, this car originally had brakes on only two wheels. Nowadays, it has brakes on all four, so it should stop okay. On the wheel here, your controls are to the left, throttle again, and on the right, ignition advance. And what you really use this for is setting the idle speed. So you move this up and down, and it'll get the engine idling and happy. And then you use the advance to set the timing. This is probably these days something more art than science. You just get it to a point where it's happy and it will run. And before you can even go anywhere, you also need to turn a few things on. So you need to activate the fuel, which you do by opening the bonnet and turning it on like you would on a motorbike. And here you've got some basic controls too. So at the top, you have your dynamo, which is currently off. In the middle, you can adjust your mixture. So you begin with it fairly rich, it's essentially a choke, and then run it actually fairly lean. You have, as mentioned previously, two independent ignition systems, and they're turned on by two switches here. You also have an amateur, apparently a Bentley invention, and this is also your light switch. So rotate, and you get your lights on, off, and side. You've got over here, oil pressure. You've got your speedo in the middle, which is actually run off a belt. And on the left, you have the clock too. It's fairly simple. You'll notice also there's a door only on one side, not uncommon for cars of this time. And uh, yeah, that's about it really. So time to find out if I've been paying attention. Well, this is an experience. I've done one practice lap around the car park and now I'm off out. Indicators are manual. Oh, turning cycle, by the way, is really, really bad. I'm gonna be the slowest thing on the roads today. Okay, let's give it a bit of, okay, a bit of throttle. First gear change. Oh, yeah, he did tell me it'd crunch, he wasn't lying. Oh, yes. All right, let's go second to third. Oh, that was all right, yeah, I can do that, I can do that. How fast are we going? 20 mile an hour. We're doing 20. Oh, as I'm sure you're all wondering, I did ask. It's worth 300,000 pounds. A Julian is about the most chill person I can imagine. You would think a Bentley owner, particularly one who'd inherited something from his father, would be very, very precious about his car. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't care about it, nothing could be further from the truth, but he's been absolutely magnificent and very encouraging this morning. So we are doing basically the speed limit now. You can see out really well. 
The steering wheel was very offset. I tried to get as far over as I could. I know that that camera is shaking about a lot, and I'm really sorry. There's not much I can I can do about it. Um, sorry. That's why I've got others like that one and that one. Hello. If you can see me, all right. It's getting the bend. And we were talking, Julian and I, earlier because you know this is this is cool, the sports car. You know, most people consider it to be a sports car, but obviously by modern standards, you you wouldn't really think of it as such, right? Let's go back into third. Oh. Oh, oh God. Oh, this all went very wrong very quickly. Okay, let's stop. Let's stop. Let's stop, let's start again. I've got this all wrong, all wrong. I'm so sorry, Julian. He did say it was a crunchy thing. Okay, let's get in there. Handbrake's definitely off. So working my way up through the gears was quite easy down, not so much. Ah, oh, there we go. There's a very particular speed at which you have to change gear in this car. Evidently, I'm not used to it yet and may never be by the end of this. It's actually quite comfortable. I know that camera's shaking about a lot. It's sat on a piece of plywood. That, see, that's fine. Second to third is the one I was worried about. That's actually not so bad. <laughs> What a thing! Oh, blimey! That was a big bump. I tell you though, I cannot imagine doing a hundred round Brooklyn's in one of these. That'd be terrifying. Genuinely terrifying. Nah. Uh, oh, for f sake. Right, let's just parking brake on and sort my camera out. So we've been using today as a filming venue a place called the Carrington Arms, it's just outside Milton Keynes. There we go, that's off. Lovely pub, very friendly petrol head proprietor. Him and his dad are really nice. Oh. I hate that noise! Oh, whoa! <laughs> it's actually not that harsh, you know? It's not too bad, yeah, that camera's a little bit better now. Although I may need adjusting again in the near future. Right turn, Clyde. So anyway, so we were talking about what made this a sports car. Because, you know, it just looks a bit like a car, doesn't it, really? And the fact is that uh, it was really a car aimed for the driver, rather than the person in the back. One of the criticisms of it in period, apparently, was the fact that it, uh, it, it didn't have a lot of room in it. And, and couldn't pull a... Uh, full-size saloon body. So as a race car, it was maybe too big. Mr. Bugatti apparently got it the fastest lorry in the world. But as a saloon car, it wasn't quite up to scratch. Please don't make me stop at the roundabout. Okay, no, that's good, that's good. Yeah, please do beat me out. And then, this is the signal for left. The throttle and brake pedal being mixed around aren't even things I'm actually worrying about too much because you're constantly worried about it, so you're always thinking about it. When you need to get worried is when you get complacent. That would be a problem. Oh, my poor camera. I'm, I'm so sorry to everyone watching at home. I know what that footage is going to look like. I'm so sorry. It's this changing down business. I, I cannot change down a gear. I cannot get down gears in this thing. Love nor money. Oh, hill start. Excellent. Handbrake on. We're in, let's check, we're in first gear. Oh, this is exciting, isn't it? First gear. It's actually got loads of torque. There's no rev counter in here, but it revved something like 3,500 RPM at most. Not exactly a VTEC lump. Oh, this sounds like I'm the least mechanically sympathetic driver in the entire world. Thirty-five to forty is my kind of comfy place in this car, to be honest. Any more than that seems a, a, bit, a bit much. You, off you get. 
not risking you falling off of Julian's lovely car. God, that nearly looks like it's still in focus as well. Ah, new angle. Shall I try reverse again? Yeah, let's try reverse again. So reverse, it's a really awkward one to get to all the way over. Lift the lockout up. Lift the lockout up. Over and there's a Mustang. Oh, okay, right. All the way over and down, right. Then clutch up, handbrake off. And I haven't stalled it yet. I'm impressed with myself for that. That's 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 something. Whoop, yeah, no, no, that's not the brake, is it? And then into first. No power steering, you may be surprised to hear. I am determined. I am absolutely ruddy determined to get downshifts correct in this thing. <laughs> so let's go second to third. Oh God, maybe a bit too quick on that. So, quick pit stop. Had spoke to Julian, got some advice. See if there's any magic to try and not crunch every single downshift. Uh, there's no special sauce. <laughs> like I said, it's a very, very understanding owner. Uh, but apparently, even amongst the people who love these cars, that is considered something of a weakness. So let's see if we can march this. Okay, they're not so bad. Yeah, a little bit quick maybe there. See? That's how it's meant to be. Right. You bastard. So as it's probably obvious by now, these are not really the simplest things in the world to drive. I'm so sorry. I, I should really be telling you a lot more about this car than I really am. But I'm just I'm just being pig-headed and stubborn now. No! You shit! Oh, you bastard. There's a bus behind me as well. At least his weight means it carries quite a bit of momentum, which is very handy. And brakes actually really nice. They're quite progressive, quite easy to use. It later transpired that I may not have been quite as incompetent as it appears. In order to make getting off the line easier, the Bentley has an unusual feature where by pressing the clutch pedal all the way, you actually stop the rotation of the gearbox. It is possible this is why I was unable to get a successful downshift from it, but after filming was completed I went out with Julian and asked him to show me how it's meant to be done. Even he admitted that it was very difficult to do smoothly and successfully despite knowing the car very well. Later models I'm told are much better behaved. The 3 litre also has a very special place in history, because aside from being a very early example, it is also one of the rare cars you could call a true Bentley. Like many others, Walter Owen was a skilled engineer, but a poor businessman. The first customer cars had barely rolled out of the factory gates when the company was already in dire financial straits. It was propped up by a wealthy enthusiast, the brilliantly named Captain Wolf Barnato. In period, he entered and won the Le Mans 24 hours three times, in 1928, 29 and 30. His name lives on today as a fabulous shade of green. The Great Depression claimed many victims, and Bentley turned out to be one. Even with the wealthy Barnato backing it, they were unable to stop the inevitable, and only nine years after the first customer cars had been delivered, the company went into receivership. Several parties showed interest, but the eventual winner by sealed bid was the British Central Equitable Trust, who purchased it for £125,000. However, even Walter Owen did not know that this was in fact a shell company, and the real winner, and therefore new owners of Bentley Motors, was in fact Rolls-Royce. Not long after, production was moved away from the original factory at Cricklewood in London. Later, enthusiasts have come to refer to this first generation of cars as the Cricklewood Bentleys. In 1938, a factory was opened in Crewe to begin producing aero engines. Later, this became the home of both Rolls and Bentley, with the latter still being headquartered there. Another first came soon after the end of the Second World War. In 1946, the first complete car, body and all, was sold from the factory. The Mark VI was made from pressed steel by a company called, confusingly, Pressed Steel. And by default, this car was in fact badged and sold as a Bentley, only for an extra fee would it be supplied with a Rolls-Royce grille. 
The two companies were intertwined for the remainder of the century until it once again went up for sale in the late 90s. In a somewhat messy set of affairs, both BMW and Volkswagen wanted Rolls, and by extension, Bentley. BMW had already been supplying parts, so seemed like their natural partner. However, their rivals made an offer that could not be refused. It turned out that VW had far more interest in the sportier Bentley brand than they did Rolls-Royce, so a second deal was done and gave BMW the rights to the Rolls name and look, but little else. This is why the fabled 6 and 3 quarter Rolls-Royce V8 spent its final years under the bonnet of a Bentley, and a new factory for them was established in Goodwood, with Bentley remaining in crew. I've decided, before the camera runs out, I'm going to end my filming piece and say uh, a great big thank you to Julian for bringing his car out and being a real good sport. To the people at the Carrington Arms for hosting us once again, also being good sports. And to the good people at Milton Keynes who have been putting up with this big green roadblock all day. I'm just going to let the cameras run just in case I do get a downshift right and I can capture it. Oh, I was warm by the way. Apparently the absolute worst thing that could happen in one of these is you're going around a bend, hitting a bump, and, and then being sort of, you know, sprung round the corner, essentially. <laughs> Sliding across the seat! Ah! <laughs> now we're going left! Let's give it some vintage beans. That's it, that's the, that's the beans. What an adventure. I'm really frustrated. Very frustrated I can't seem to get it to shift down, but hey ho. Upshift's no problem. We'll meet again, Bentley. Next time. <laughs>